Alrighty, so good evening, everyone. We're going to be uh, looking tonight, we're uh, looking at chapters 20 to 24. Those are the chapters that we're going to be focusing on. And um, we're going to, you know, focus a little bit more on specifically chapters 20, 23, and 24. Those are the ones that we'll focus uh, most prominently on, and we'll kind of analyze a couple of sections. And in doing so, we'll, we'll kind of get a, a, a a better understanding as to what Yechezkel um, is going through during these chapters. These particular chapters uh, focus very heavily on the Chorban. It's often not direct, it's often indirect through prophecy, through imagery, um, but that's really what the focus is on tonight, uh, really just sheer uh, destruction. So we're going to open up um, in chapter 20. We'll look at a couple pieces there, um, just to analyze a few kind of major themes. I'll repost in the chat just right now the, uh, the source sheet for those of you who don't have it, and we'll get started. Okay, and as always, feel free to, uh, to jump in um, as well. Okay, so if you look here at the very beginning um, of the, of the parak, it opens up, and it was in the seventh year, what are we talking about? The seventh year of what? So Chazal tell us, Rashi, etc. They tell us that... Exile. What was that? Yehoyachin's uh, exile. So either it could be... Uh, yes, yeah, essentially it's the same, right? Because it's, it's Yehoyachin's exile, which is also what? The seventh yeah, year. Countdown towards the Horban. Countdown towards the Horban. It's also, I believe, the seventh year of Tzidkiah, right? Because he gets exiled and then it's the right. seventh Exactly. And that means that we're essentially four years before Chorban Abai. So this is getting us used to it, but what's the date? What's the date here? Chamishi, it's the fifth month, the tenth of the month. What's the fifth month? Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av, exactly. This is the tenth of Av, and we know the Chazal kind of debate is it the ninth of Av is it the tenth of Av and, and kind of the the understanding is really that in the bias Rishon the tenth of Av may have been more important in bias Shani it started on the ninth the burning continued really on the tenth um, but essentially this is Tisha B'av. this is the tenth of Av so obviously this is not the Chorban yet it's a couple of years down the road but what potentially is going on here um, is that every year and I believe this was the uh, the Radak who pointed out that every year leading up to Chorban Abai on essentially Tisha B'av, the Navi would essentially come forth and remind people that like, this is the day that's going to be an awful day if we don't turn back, if we don't do proper tshuva. And so what we see in the text before us is really interesting because what happens is It sounds like they're actually doing tshuva, right? The elders of Israel, we constantly see Yechezkel with the elders and they're seeking out God, they're calling out to God. And yet, what's the prophet's response? You're coming to, you know, ask about me. Meaning, as I live, I will not respond, says Hashem, to that which you request of me. It's very odd, right? It almost sounds like they're doing the right thing, right? They're lidrosh et Hashem. And yet God seems to castigate them through the Navi. What is going on here? Why does Hashem refuse to listen to their lidrosh et Hashem? Any, any thoughts? They haven't changed their behavior. They're just looking for an out. Mm, yes. Lidrosh et Hashem, it's they're seeking out God, meaning they, they want to know like what's going to happen, right? They know the Navi talks and perhaps every year about something. So they want to know what's going to happen. But it doesn't mean they stopped asking their idols what's going to happen. It doesn't mean they've changed their actions, right? They're essentially using God as the, you know, the, uh, the, the weather, the weatherman, right? What's the weather going to be tomorrow? And then let me ask someone else as well. They, they, they don't really trust in Hashem. So God says, I'm not going to answer. And there's much more to be said about Lidrosh Hashem. Like what are the instances in, in, in Tanakh that we see that? But essentially they're seeking out um, God to, to find out. Um, to find out an answer to something. And God says, you haven't changed your ways, so I will not answer. So this is how chapter 20 opens up. Um, and note also they're referred to as Zikne Yisrael, Israel. Whenever you see Israel here, it's often a derogatory, 
right? Normally, if it says Zikne Yehuda, it's a little bit better. Yisrael, right? Those are the northern tribes. They were exiled. They're sinners. So Zikne Yehuda is a little bit, um, Zikne Yisrael, excuse me, is a little bit of a, a put down for, for the people. But that's how it opens up. I want to now shift um, to another part of chapter 20, which is really quite incredible when you read it, just shot, right? It's, it's pretty wild. We're going to jump to verse 25. Right, the rest talks a little bit about uh, what's going to take place, the destruction essentially, but 20, verse 25 tells us something quite incredible. It says the Pasuk, natati lehem, Hashem, speaking through the Navi essentially, I have given the Jewish people what? Chukim lo tovim. God says he's given us, the Jewish people, laws that are not good. Umishpatim lo yichubahem, and rules which they could not live by. Wow. Right, if I were of a different religion, this is like, <laughs> this is like uh, proof. Uh, it's 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 fails from the get go. God gave us these laws. He knew he was going to fail, and then he was going to throw us out and get. What is going on in this pasuk? Chukim lo tovim mishpatim, and laws that you're not going to live by. What is the prophet? What is Hashem telling the Jewish people? Any thoughts on that? You know, it's clear that uh, the Mepharshim were also quite taken aback by that Pasuk. Like, what does that mean? So I'll share with you a couple uh, of ideas. You can take, you know, whatever you feel um, perhaps is, is most pertinent to this particular Pasuk. But essentially, um, one approach is that of Rav David Kimchi uh, the, uh, of the Radak. And he suggests that the laws that are referenced here is not the Torah. Rather, if you look in the Pasuk, perhaps what the laws that are referenced here are laws that God has imposed on the Jewish people through the non-Jewish nations. Meaning, I gave to you, the Jews, bad ordinances, bad laws that you now have to follow because you are living under non-Jewish kingdoms. So one way to read it is to say, this is not talking about the Torah, right? This is talking about living under you know, rulers that don't let you practice your religion freely or that treat Jews harshly or that treat people badly. That's one approach. That's the Radax, um, that's the Radax approach. And that's one potential uh, way to look at it. Um, another way to perhaps look at it is they're essentially chukim lo tovim and mishpatim lo yechubahem if we don't follow them. Meaning if we're sinners, if we go down the wrong path, so yeah, then the Torah is a trap. Because what happens if you don't follow the Torah? You get the klolos, right? You get the, that's what we just learned about this past parsha, right? The tocha. So essentially, if God um, permits us to go down the wrong path, which He does, because we have free will, so then the Torah becomes the sam hamavet in the language of Chazal, becomes this this poison if we don't properly keep the Torah. So that's another way, perhaps, to per, to interpret uh, this pasuk as well. I don't know if anybody else has any other ideas. Feel free to to unmute or to, to throw it in the chat, but that is essentially two major opinions as to what this kind of very odd Pasuk is, is truly talking about. Chapter 20 is all about leading up to the destruction, right? It, it's talking about what's going to happen in the destruction. Um, and toward the end of chapter 20, we get a section that personally I found to be exceptionally intriguing um, and the Pirushim on the section became even more interesting, right? The shot alone is interesting, but I want, I'll share with you at least one Pirush, which is just, it's somewhat, it's, it's not, it's like wild when you hear it. Um, and I'll explain the context. So if you look at the end of chapter 20, it's, it's essentially describing what will happen as we, the Jewish people, are being punished. And it sounds like it's like the Chorban takes place, and then eventually God continues to punish us in, in, in various ways. And so the Pasuk picks up, it picks up in verse 34. And I'm just going to show that uh, to you now. Verse 34 picks up and it opens up in a way that sounds like good things are about to be spoken about. You know, if somebody like opens a, a sentence and it sounds like all is good and then they kind of, you know, give you an insult at the end. It, it's kind of, that's how the way the Pasuk seems to be structured. Verse 34, God's going to take us out of the nations. It sounds like Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We're going to be taken out of the lands of the nations that we've been exiled to. Great. This sounds like we're about to hear about some peaceful redemption. The kibatz diatram is going to ingather us. It's like amazing. It's like 
the exact language from Yitzhak Mitzrayim, but then it gets a little strange. Uvachema shifucha. Pour down and, anger. What is it? Pour, pour down anger. Yeah, so it, 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 at the very end, it seems to yeah. like shift. It flips. It, it flips. Exactly. He, it sounds like everything's good, and then it's like, oh, I'm taking you out in this, like, rage. Wait a minute. That, that's not what I wanted. I wanted God to take me out. You know, al what, What's going on the, on the wings of eagle? So what's going on here? It continues. Where are we going? We're going to a desert of the people. That's not where I want to go. I want to go to Eretz Zavach Halabudvash. But wait, wait, God actually is going to come panim panim. That sounds great. But it's judgment day. Meaning, so what we see here is an obvious attempt by the Navi in the way that he's, uh, you know, describing it. It's supposed to, on the one hand, make us feel like redemption's coming. But on the other hand, recognize that the way redemption's actually going to come about is through this intense um, judgment. Right, judgment's going to take place. This, this notion of Yom Hadin is going to happen before redemption. Again, are we talking about redemption, the 70 years to the second temple? Likely not, right? This is likely describing something much down, much further down the road, we would say like the end of days. So we'll describe a little bit more what's going on. I just want to look at a few other kind of pieces here before we tie it together. So God's going to bring this into this wilderness of the nations. And what's he going to do? It's this imagery, you're going to pass before a staff. What's this a reference to? When they would, yeah, anybody? Uh... Yom Kippur, you have, the, you have allusions to Yom Kippur. Uh, yeah, Yom and Kippur was... essentially taking it from here. Right. Which is the notion. Right. That, the other way around, yes. Which means that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the liturgy got it from Yechezka, the yeah. liturgy. Um, <laughs> which is this notion that we're sheep, Right, we, we know the stop. We're sheep going before Kadosh Baruch Hu, and God's marking us. God's saying you, you're you're going to be redeemed, and you're not. I mean, that's essentially what we see here. And God will essentially um, bring us into a covenant. habrit. So essentially, some will be having some Brit, some will not. Um, and then it goes on and on. We're not going to look at it all inside. Eventually, we go kiva har kochi. Right? Eventually, we end up in the Holy Land. But again, not everyone makes it there. Only some make it to the Holy Land. So what's essentially going on here is the, uh, Yechezkel is describing a stage, uh, uh, an epoch in history where, where Jews are going to be gathered in this midbar from all the places that they lived, judged. Some won't enter the land of Israel and some will go on to enter the land of Israel. So it's clearly some sort of eschatological vision um, when that will happen, um, who knows? Although, if you open the Abar Banel, um, he tells us when it's going to happen. <laughs> so I just want to share with you his approach. The Abar Banel, I think I mentioned this maybe back when we were learning, um, maybe it was Malachim, I can't recall. Um, the Abar Banel um, wrote a Sefer um, all about calculating the end of days, right? It was a very popular genre, probably less so today, but it was very popular in the early modern, late medieval period. They'd write these books about uh, how to calculate the end of days. Um, and in his commentary on these sukkim, he notes that, you know, if you look at my Sefer, I have a whole long piece about this, but let me just give you um, a short, a short piece of it. So I just want to share it with you. It's obviously not the necessarily the shot, but I just think it's an interesting uh, insight into the mind of the Abarbanel. He says, what's going on here? First of all, he describes how this parallels Yitzhak Mitzrayim, right? We came out of Egypt. We were sinners, right? We, we were in the lowest parts of Tuma. We were over the Avodah Zara, we, everything. We go to the Midbar and the Midbar in, in, in some sense becomes like this, this, this space where we get purged of our sins and receive the Torah. And that's essentially why one generation dies out, the midbar. And then the next generation enters. So the same thing is happening at the end of days. We're ingathered from the nations, put in this midbar, whatever that may be, purged essentially. And then we get, some of us get to enter into the land of Israel. So you see why there's a parallel there according to the Abarba now. And he says, I just want to let you know, I'll tell you when it's going to happen. So just to tell you what he tells us, just because it's fascinating, just from a historical perspective, 
he says essentially this is go this started this 40 years he says it's going to be 40 years just like we were in the midbar this 40 year period started in 1464 right he gives us the dates and he explains and i'll just give you just a taste of it he says you know during that year we saw harsh uh, decrees against jews in piedmont in lombardy in portugal and norbon in naples and florent he goes and names all the places along the mediterranean and he says this is when the 40 years began the 40 years will end around 1505 and that's essentially when redemption will start to start creep in that's what he describes and he thinks that the the real redemption is going to start in 1531 this comes up quite often in the Abarbanel. I personally am very fond of the Abarbanel's commentary. When you read these pieces, and it might not be what I'm used to, but um, it's really interesting to, to see. Um, and that was something that Don, uh, Don Yitzhak, Yitzhak Abarbanel would often um, discuss. Okay, I just wanted to give you that taste of the parish of the Abarbanel uh, before we move on. So essentially this piece is telling us what's gonna happen in the end of days and it parallels the beginning of the nation of our people as a, as a nation and the end of our of our people, um, uh, you know, in exile. So you really get to see how Yechezkel envisions uh, kind of the arc of Jewish history, which is really quite fascinating. Um, and God as the Dayan and we as the people as as those being those being judged. Any questions or comments on that uh, on that section? Just a quick question: what what makes a Barbanel come up with that date? Like why fifty yeah. years? So, um, the Abarbanel uses the book of Daniel. So when we get to book of Daniel, God willing, in like a year plus from now or whatnot, um, the book of Daniel has, has a lot of to do with the kingdoms and a lot of messianic, you know, notions to it. And so it was very popular in the medieval period to use the book of Daniel as ways to under, to calculate the redemption of the Jewish people. And so they often would impose Sefer Daniel and dates and understandings and numbers onto different Sifrei Chazal. Um, and essentially they would calculate from, let's say, the Chorban or from Avram Avinu when they would, they would add years. And, you know, they'd be off a little bit. The Abarbanel even himself would sometimes recognize that he was off. And, you know, that's, uh, that's what would happen. So it's a much larger conversation, but that's uh, a little bit of what's going on there. I'd like to, I'd like to ask you about this parallel theme that we've been studying in uh, this week's assignment. And that thing, it's, it's a very uh, complicated theme. I've thought about it a lot. I don't have a conclusion, but a, a, a answer. But the Almighty keeps saying, look, you don't deserve, I've given you all these uh, uh, chances. You keep listening to false prophets. Uh, no one in Jerusalem, in one of the chapters, no one in Jerusalem is, uh, is clean anymore. The priests, everybody is corrupt. And uh, you're going to be destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. You're going to be thrown out. Some of you are going to be killed by the sword. Some of you are going to die by famine. Some of you are going to uh, be, uh, go to another land and be servants wherever you are. But then he says, but regardless of what you do, I'm not breaking the covenant. And I'm going to bring you back, even if you don't deserve it, because I'm going to keep the covenant. So this is sort of a parallel, if not exact, um, theme of what you just said about the Barmanel, who's, who's predicting that this is all going to work out anyway, even though we don't deserve it. And it's very hard to put, uh, I've had trouble putting my arms around this, um, trying to figure out, you know, how does this all fit? Yeah, yeah, excellent point. When you find out the answer, let me know. Um, but essentially, you know, it, it, it's tricky, meaning we we believe that God judges us for our actions. And we believe obviously that every individual gets judged not only on their own, but also we as a community, as a people. Um, but no matter how low we go, um, God always will come back to us because God won't break his covenant. And even if we break it, so God can punish us, but he, he has to leave someone left over. I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu was told the Jewish people are going to get annihilated, but I'm going to save you. And he wouldn't have it. So essentially, God is always going to keep a covenant with descendants of Avram Avinu. Um, who those will be, that's, that's the question, but meaning it's going to be somebody from our people. Um, and redemption will happen if we do well, if we do the right thing, it'll be hastened. If we don't do well, so it'll just have to, we'll have to wait out the course of history until, until it happens.
Did anything happen in 1505? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure many things happened, but um, I don't know if anything wasn't, happened wasn't, specifically. Wasn't that, the expulsion, wasn't that the expulsion from Portugal? Was it 1505? Was it 1497? Yeah, yeah it, it was. Portugal was earlier, but it is the Inquisition yeah. period. And everybody's yeah. in flux and 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 on the move for trouble. Which is exactly why he 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 literally references from his understanding of what the Jewish world is, right? That whole European area, it's all under most much of it's under Inquisition. There are no Jews in in most of Western Europe at this point. Um, and the Jews living in central, you know, Italy, Germany, they're all being persecuted. So essentially saying there's something happening. We know that something is happening all the time, but essentially that was the date that he put down. Um, and that was that was his approach to uh, to learning this. Well, but that was not a redemption. So it's, you know, maybe it was a step in the redemption. I, I don't know, right? Uh, I'm not well versed enough to, to be able to say it was or was, wasn't, right. but he may not think it's the full redemption. Maybe it's a step, just as we well, may. You do essentially view, let's say, Yom Atzmaut, Yom Yerushalayim as steps within a broader process. It doesn't mean that it's the end all, but it's it's somewhere in there. Point of information. Hello. Can I ask a question? Yes. If you stand back and look at it somewhat globally or historically, Jewish history and God's relationship to the Jews has been cyclical. Well, that's all of Jewish history into the most recent times. We somehow get into it, and we always get out of it. So that is really the long-term history of our relationship to Hashem, Hashem to us. Why we have to go through this cycle, why we can't live on an even keel and accept a way of living that is universally appropriate is beyond me. That's it. Yeah, we can only observe and comment on what we see, but uh, why exactly, we, we don't always know. Yeah, but it's Yom Yerushalayim, and you know you've had an uptick, so uh, if anything else, it should give us thought. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't go on a, it's not an easy, you know, one directional path, certainly not. So I think at this point we'll shift um, from chapter 20, and we're now gonna shift our focus um, to chapter 23. We're gonna just give a, an overview of chapter 23 with, with some insights. Chapter 23 is quite famous. Um, I feel like sometimes we may overuse the word famous, but I think it's a pretty famous section. Um, it's the section of Ohala and Ohaliba. Um, it's most commonly known to us, actually probably not from Sefer Yechazkel. It's most commonly known to us, I think probably from the Piyut or the, the, really the Dirge, um, the Kina, that we say on Tisha B'Av, right? The Shlomo Ibn Gabiro wrote a kina um, where he talks about essentially two sisters, Ohala and Ohaliba, talking to each other about essentially who had, um, who was punished worse in Jewish history. Right? It's one of the keynotes that you see in Tisha B'Av morning. Um, and this is essentially where he got it from. He essentially personifies the characters that we're gonna talk about now in a greater, in greater detail. Um, but this is the original story of Ohala and Ohaliba. So, so what is this Ohala and Ohaliba? It's a little confusing because their names are nearly identical, which is obviously part of the reason they have those names. But what exactly is this? So let's just open up the opening verses because that'll just give us the lay of the land. Um, and I know that we, we've seen this before, but I just wanna, just for the purposes of, of, of broadening our understanding and, and kind of delving into it, what happens? It opens up that a person, Ben Adam, Stein Nashim, has two wives. Right, and they're the daughters of, the of of one mother, so they're sisters, and somebody is married to them. Um, and these two sisters, um, you know, that is Nana and Mitzrayim, they 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 did harlotry in Egypt in their youth when they were young, and then essentially, what are their names? Verse four: Ohala is the is the elder, the eldest sister, and Ohaliva is the younger sister. And it's interesting. So usually, when you have a parable, you often don't tell you tell the, the the listeners the you know the message until the end. But here, at least in Yisrael, they actually tell us who they are from the get go. I think that's probably added later in the sense that maybe when Yisrael spoke these words to the people, he didn't do that because it kind of loses um, the purpose of telling the parable, which is like you tell a story and then at the very end you say, oh by the way, that's you. 
right? So that's probably what happened, but perhaps when he wrote it down, he added it in. Who are these people? Shomron is Ohala and Yerushalayim is Ohaliba. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment. Why are they called Ohaliba and Ohala? And why do we need this parable at all, right? Why can't God, Yechezkel, just tell us that we were sinners, Yerushalayim and Shomron, the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom. What's the purpose of this whole parable about these two sisters who are harlots? Um, and why doesn't God just spell it out for us? What's the purpose of this chapter? I think it's because <clears throat> it's much easier to uh, intellectualize and emotionalize the wrongdoings of a person, especially a young girl, young women, mm -hmm. to us, that it is the immensity of, of a very large community. Yeah, yeah, and I think obviously telling a story often makes it much more understandable for, you know, for the average person as well, right? We like to tell stories. Stories, you know, from, from childhood through adulthood, stories have a purpose. And so here we have a story where we essentially interchange the names and talk about two sisters, right? And this is obviously not the first time we've seen Judah and Israel, Shimon and Yerushalayim being referred to as sisters. This happens quite often. It's a motif um, in, the later, in the later books of Tanakh. Um, and what exactly do their names mean? What's an ohel? Tent. A tent. So ohala is Shomron. Why? So there's a couple different interpretations here, meaning her name is essentially like her tent. It's her tent, ohala, her tent. One interpretation to understand this is to say her tent, why? Because the Northern Kingdom was pure idolatry. Her tent, this is what she did in her tent, meaning the Northern Kingdom, it was all about her, it was her, about her idolatry. In Jerusalem, it wasn't just about idolatry. Yes, they did idolatry. That was one of the major sins, but ohaliba means to say that in her tent was her, meaning Hashem's presence, meaning God, Yerushalayim, the Shrina rested within Ohaliba, within Yerushalayim. So essentially they both have these tents, but one has Yerushalayim in it and one does not. So off the bat, there's a little bit of a, uh, a difference in the two, in the two uh, sisters, um, yet both of them um, continue to sin. The continuation of this text, which we're not going to read inside um, all the way through, but as you read in advance, um, is probably the most explicit um, biological sexual text in all of in all of Yechesko, certainly, if not all of Nevi'im, if not all of Chumash. Right? It describes the sisters um, as as being with the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Right? And that's what we're up to now. Babylonians, those are the ones who are going to destroy by, by Rishom. And it describes the empires by referring to them as almost like knights in shining armor, right? In the sense that we were, we were enamored by these, these men and we sought after them. And then we got to a point where our harlotry ended up becoming a relationship where the man actually abused the woman. Right, that happens in the text, right? We want to be with someone else, not with God, the other empires. We want to be with them. And then they abuse us, pillage us, rape us. It's described very explicitly um, in the text itself. And I think that goes back to this notion that when we're telling a story, it's, 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 it's so much more, uh, you can connect so much more to it when you think about like young women as representing the Jewish people. Right, because that which they decided, they made wrong decisions, right? Everyone makes bad decisions in life. And then they continue down the path. They never return. And so God punishes. Um, first, Ohala, the older sister, Shomron, and then Ohaliba, right? The younger sister, um, Yerushalayim, Judah, where the, uh, where the temple um, is found. Is there, is there some kind of a connection to the, to the Shorish lave? Oh, because Ohaliba, that's interesting. Um, the lave, lave, you, lave um, that's where God's heart is, and that's what, what's the heart of right, okay. to make this was. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. I would say 
probably not on a shot level, but certainly on a midrashic level, because the word ohel, I think, serves as the root, but it wouldn't be that crazy to think that when crafting it, that, that two obviously do sit next to each other. That's a very, uh, that's a very interesting point. Thank you. Um, also, um, picking up on this, this, this theme that these women were harlots, um, the notion of calling them tents has both the notion that people are coming in and out of the tent, all of these different nations, um, and also essentially um, that, uh, you know, an ohel, which obviously is like the word that we refer to as the ohel mo'ed, right? It, it's, it's an abomination towards the ohel mo'ed, right? We call the, the holiest place the ohel mo'ed, and then they become the ohel, this tent, which also, it, it has this notion, what do you do with the tent? You don't stay put, right? A bite stays put. An ohel travels around a bit. And essentially what we become are these, you know, uh, uh, these uh, personified women who were chasing after um, all the other empires and, and, and push aside Hashem. So that's essentially what the whole chapter is trying to get at. Um, there's Isn't so much- in the Noel also a meeting place? Yes. When we say Ohel Moed, it was a meeting place. And we talk about big tent parties. Tent is, is like, it's, it's a place where people come together or or things come together, ideas come together. Yes, precisely. Um, and that's kind of what we see here. Um, does anybody have any other comments or questions on the um, Ohaliba and Ohala? Um, so, I mean, there's there's so much here. If you look in the text, uh, we obviously don't have time to go through all of the details here, but it's just like the incredible detail that Yechezkel puts into describing each empire you know, the chariots that they rode and the, the armor that they had and how we sought them out. Um, and also the, the intense language of, of what we did that disgusted Hashem um, is really quite, quite incredible. And when you get to the end of this section of Ohala and Ohaliba, essentially we also, Ohaliba gets punished too, right? She is Judah, she will get punished. That's what's about to happen. But at the very end, we have essentially one last verse which says something very odd. What does it say? I'll pull it up for you. Verse 45. Vanashim sadikim, righteous men, heima yishpetu otem, they will judge, right, otem, them, the women, the two sisters, mishpat no'afot, they're going to judge them for being uh, adulterers, and mishpat shofotam, or murderers as well, kino afot heina v'dam right? They were adulterers, they had blood on their hands for all the people, who were killed in the interim, but who are the people who will punish them? Anashim Sadikim. Who are the Anashim Sadikim? Who are these righteous men who will punish us, right? Judah, Shomron, who are the righteous men? So it's a bit complex because on the one hand, it sounds like Sadiqim are going to punish us because we're the Rishayim. So some Sadiqim will come around and punish us somehow, whoever, whoever they are. But um, the interpretations here are quite interesting. Rashi points out, who are the Anashim Sadiqim, the righteous men? They are essentially the, the judges and the, the masters of the courts of the Babylonians and the Assyrians, meaning to say the righteous men really here just means like the men of, of, high, um, of high esteem in those societies will punish us. Meaning what? They're not actually tzaddikim. The word tzaddik here doesn't really mean tzaddik. It just means men in high powers, uh, in, 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 in seats of power are gonna punish us. And it actually becomes even more explicit um, when you look at the Abarbanel, he actually says explicitly that um, these tzaddikim um, are clearly not Sadiqim, but they're called Sadiqim because they're doing Ritzon Hashem. The will of God is to punish Ohala and Ohliba, Judah and Samaria. And so we get punished through the Anashim Sadiqim because they get to do God's will. Now, we've seen this trope before, which is to say that, yes, the non Jewish nations that punish us, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, right? God sends them essentially, but they often go too far or they didn't do it properly. So God will punish them for what they did to us, 
But on the same token, they were also somewhat in the right. And so it's almost like tzaddikim here um, is facetious, right? It's saying, right, they're the tzaddikim and you're the rishon, even though we know that they're savages as well, right? They're, it's just an interesting um, literary flourish that the, po uh, that the prophet puts at the very end of the Ohala in Ohaliba. It also makes sense because we've just literally described 40 verses of the most heinous sins that these women did. So that anything less than that, like, you know, right? it's like, you can't get worse than Ohala and Ohaliba. So essentially we get punished for that. Uh -huh. Yes. It would seem to parallel uh, the beginning of this section also where uh, the words have uh, almost an ironic meaning, you know, that they, the God is talking about the midbar and the redemption and, uh, and yet its meaning is uh, to the contrary or the prophet is talking. And here too, uh, the words that are used are in a way ironic uh, and have, uh, you know, an edge to them. Yes, certainly the prophet knew how to, you know, use his uh, vocabulary, his words, his literary flourish, and put it um, in a way to really drive uh, deeply into the hearts of the Jewish people what he meant to say. Great point. Okay. Rabbi, to your point, um, <clears throat> very graphic chapter. Um, I kept, I'm using the art scroll, so I kept jumping down, which I normally don't JPS do. JPS is much more explicit, I promise you. Sorry? I said the JPS translation is much more explicit than the art scroll. <laughs> I mean, th this was pretty explicit. And I just, I didn't understand why it needed to be so graphic um, and so sexual in nature, as opposed to, you know, we're turning our back, we're, we're not following God, we're chasing after idols. Why the connection so much in such a graphic way? Yeah, so I, I thought about that a little bit and I was trying to search for the answer that worked for me. And I honestly, it's, it's hard. I personally found it challenging to find the answer. Um, but what I, what I kind of maybe worked for me, and I don't know if this is really a fully baked uh, answer, um, is that Yechezkel is reflecting the world that the audience understood. I was thinking that, yeah. So it's not that Yechezkel had any interest. Like I saw, uh, you know, uh, Robert Alter, the famous biblical scholar, um, you know, he said, you know, he talked a little bit about this passage and he said, maybe some other people said like, what's with Yechezkel's fascination and, and specific interest in this exceptionally sexualized literary language? It's like, that's, that's beneath the prophet. And I think they're right. But what's really going on here is that I think he's talking to an audience that speaks this language. And in some sense, he was able to, to get uh, you know, to their psyche by essentially talking in a way that made sense to them. Um, that's kind of one, one way I, I thought about it. I, I thought when you mentioned it, I haven't read it in that time, that this was part of their iniquity. This is exactly, because a lot of Avodasara, even today, is tied up with this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. So that must have been, he figured that that's, that's their world, like you said. Yeah. I think he's also speaking through the ages. I think he's speaking to us today. So what motivates us to really feel bad about the behavior of our ancestors? That they made bad alliances with a lot of bad deals, you know? I mean, that happens all the time. But if you put it in this, these kind of terms, wow, this is despicable. And then you transfer that over from the sexual, which he didn't, he's using as a metaphor, to the actual, you now start understanding how, how bad it really was. That's what I think is happening here. Yeah, and it's essentially timeless, right? No matter what age you're living in, right? Anyone with like a moral, you know, Speck in them understands like what is being described here is just off. So I thought they're offering their children to Molech. I thought that was even worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's also true. They describe and it's interesting. I have not spoken about this um, 
But really, there is what to be said about this constant trope, not only in Ichesco, but also, if I'm not mistaken, it's in Yeshayahu, but maybe I'm confusing it with Yermiyahu, about um, bringing children to Molech, right? One of the prohibitions that's described in Afrim of Kedoshim, bringing, you know, either it's a machloket, did the children die or did the children just get passed through fire? It's an interesting discussion. Um, but it seems to be there's this constant reminder, stop doing this. Why do you keep doing this? So clearly, Jews in the time of the spy Rishon were offering their children to the God Molech. Right? That was something that was happening. And that's something else that is constantly described, um, constantly described as well. It seems to be an inclination. You have this in Mexico among the Incas. Mm -hmm. they, they brought their, their children on these stupas and, and they, they, they worshiped, uh, they, they offered them to, to God to either burn them or, or you know, they just let, left them to rot. But it seems to be a human inclination that we're no longer, we're no longer, it's not part of us anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the chidushim of the Torah is to say, we may have that inclination, right? To get close to a deity, a God, but we, we never offer our children, we offer a korban. In, in their place. And that's obviously- That's know. one of the things we changed. We didn't do any human sacrifice. In fact, I, I want to read that the Rambam said that our, our, our Karbanos channeled, channeled that energy towards animal sacrifice rather than human sacrifice. Yes, exactly, in his Mona Yeah. So at this point, we're gonna to turn to our last topic of the evening. Um, which is sections or selections, I guess, from chapter 24. The final chapter that we prepared for this evening, chapter 24, um, we're going to just briefly look at the very first two verses, and then we'll talk about the very tragic story of Yechezkel's wife. So the opening, just, uh, just to briefly look at this, is just because it's fascinating. How does chapter 24 open up? We're now the ninth year. So two years have gone by since we just spoke about. So we're essentially two years before Chorban Abayi. We're in the 10th month. What date is this? 10th month, 10th day. Yud-Tavis. Asar B'Tavis. Asar B'Tavis, exactly. Asar B'Tavis is the beginning of the siege of Yerushalayim and Bayi Rishon, a day in which we still fast today. Um, and this Pasuk is describing the beginning of the siege of Yerushalayim. Right? We revolted, we weren't supposed to, and the Babylonians place a siege on the city, and that begins the starvation of the Jews in the city. And verse 2 is actually very important halachically. Ben Adam, he says, Yechezkel, right on uh, right down essentially at etzem hayom has at this exact date write this down samach melech bavel yerushalayim the etzem hayom has on this very day the babylonians laid siege on yerushalayim etzem hayom has is also used with yitzyam mitzrayim right on this very day we left mitzrayim which is why we can only celebrate pesach on the 14th going into the 15th but we can't do it mirosh chodesh right etzem hayom has is understood by Chazal to mean the fast of Asar B'tevet must take place on Asar B'tevet. It does not get pushed off, right? So what happens? Tisha B'Av falls on a Shabbos. Shiva Seber Samus falls on a Shabbos. What do we do? We fast on Sunday. We push it off a day. Asar B'tevet is always observed on the exact date it falls, which is why it's the only fast that we have on a Friday going into Shabbos, right? That was, uh, was that this past year? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. This past year, we had Asar B'tevet on an Erev Shabbos, um, and that essentially means you fast and you go right into Shabbos. If Asar B'tevet were to fall on Shabbos itself, it's a whole interesting discussion, um, essentially we would fast on Shabbos because it says the Etzim Ayom it's a whole discussion, uh, maybe for a shir for another time, but it's because it's this exact day, which is to say that the beginning of the siege, which is not destruction yet, is essentially um, should be considered in our mind the beginning of, of Puranut, the beginning of, of evil, of wickedness, of destruction, has to be observed um, in, a, in a very uh, um, serious way. Just as we observe the beginning of redemption, 
with Pesach, so too we must observe the beginning of destruction. Right? Beginnings have meaning to it. Just as ends have meaning, beginnings have meaning. And when you trace something back to something and say, that's the reason, that's the day you need to begin um, and continue to, to mourn over our table. It turns out the calendar never falls on, Shab on, on Shabbos itself, so you don't ever have to worry about it. Um, but essentially, that is etzem hayom hazeh. So now that the siege has begun, God turns to Yichad. So in the last couple of minutes, we'll focus on, on, this, on this really um, very sad um, section. We read about another something, another metaphor, but really something that also happens uh, in reality which is the death of Yechezkel's wife. God says to Yechezkel, Ben Adam, I'm going to take from you et machmad enecha, the beauty of your eyes, b'magefa, in a plague. And what may you not do? V'lotispod, you cannot make a haspid, v'lotifke, you may not cry. V'lo tavo dimatecha, do not shed a tear. And essentially tells him, similar to what Moshe tells Aaron, Henek Dom, be silent. Matim Evel Lota said, don't mourn. Essentially, all the things described here are what we do do when we sit Shiva or Shloshim. Um, but here he's told Dafka not to do any of the mourning peri periods. And he says, I'll speak to the nation. Excuse me. Boker. Um, I'll speak to the nation in the morning. Vatomat ishto be'erev. My wife died in the evening. Vaas baboker kasher kibisi. And then I did not mourn. So what happens? His wife dies, and everyone sees that his wife died in the plague. But what's he not doing? He has no avelos. Meaning, it's it's very odd. Right? His wife just died, and he doesn't have any tears. He has no outward avelos. So they turn to him and they say, "What are you?" What are you doing? You should be sitting Shiva. And he says, this is what God wants of me. Because, what's the message? Why should there be no notion of, of mourning? This brings us back to Eicha, famously, because no one will be mourning with us with the destruction of the temple, meaning we're all alone as a nation. So essentially, because nobody is able to be Menachem Avel, we don't get to mourn. He says it explicitly. He, and more the Beit Yisrael, Hashem, I'm going to essentially destroy, desecrate my sanctuary, the strength of you, Machmad in the same language, right? Your wife is your Machmad. The temple is Machmad of me, Hashem, or of the nation. So again, we have this, this metaphor, this message, that God is going to, God is going to uh, take Yechezkel's wife and she becomes Yerushalayim. She becomes the temple and Yechezkel becomes a stand-in for Hashem or the Jewish people. And so we again see a, 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 a parable that is, is, is everlasting, right? right? It's something that can be understood in any generation, the loss of a spouse. Um, and, and it's interesting because Right. What did his wife do to deserve this? Right. She becomes the, the messenger for God's word, but like what, who, I assume she was Yechezkel's wife, so she must have been a tzaddikit, right? How can God take her life as a message? So the Mepharshim struggle with that. One approach is to note that it was a magefa, it was a plague. And if you recall earlier, God said, when I unleash a plague, Russia tzaddik, it doesn't matter. Right. When we get to this uh, time period, doesn't matter. God will unleash fury even on the tzaddikim. Remember, they're not in Yerushalayim anymore. They're in Bavel. So there was a plague that clearly broke out there. And uh, God is going to ensure um, that they are punished um, um, rightfully uh, so. And it essentially, it goes out to anyone, meaning that God does not decipher, uh, differentiate between the people. And in doing so, the message here is the following. There's two things that are in the message. Bob now pointed out for us. God is telling the nation at this very moment that I'm going to do two things that you thought could never happen. One, God is essentially telling us uh, in these verses, I mean, it continues, I've given just an excerpt, that Yerushalayim is going to be conquered. You thought the Ga'on Uzchem, this is like the city, can't be conquered. 
That's like telling a person living in Constantinople in 1453, this city can't be, what was it, like 30 plus times in, in the history that it was attempted to be conquered by uh, centuries it stood. This is the Eastern Roman Empire. It can't be conquered. And then it gets conquered. And then we say the same thing. Fuck, the base of Mikdash? Absolutely not. It's God's home on earth. And God says, no, I put it there and I can remove myself from the base of Mikdash as well. So essentially, there were two things the Jews thought were impossible. And if you think something's impossible, you won't cherish it. And unfortunately, I, I would say, this, with notwithstanding right, what's going on, let's say, necessarily currently uh, in Israel, right? if you think that the state of Israel is something that was given to us, God, God can't take that away. Of course he can. But who says God can't take it away from us? It's the same notion, right? right? God grants us things. And if we don't treat it well, it, it doesn't have to last. Um, and, and this is, I think, the message of Yechezkel's wife tragically dying, um, that, that, that God can decide that tragedy is the strike, and God does. Um, the Abarbanel also adds that she was not a sinner. She was not a sinner. But when, like I mentioned, Magefa came out, and we unfortunately know this this year more than any other, that plagues do not differentiate between the Rishayim um, and the Tzadikim. And so she dies. Um, and we actually see here, and with this essentially I'll close, um, the name Yechezkel appears. Do you, do you anyone notice that? Remember the whole book, except at the very beginning, it says Ben Adam, Ben Adam, Ben Adam, Ben Adam, son of man. And yet here in this passage, let's scroll down here. At the very end, he says, Ezekiel will become a, like a symbol to you, a Mufet, a portent. Meaning, whatever he did, you will do. Like you lost, he lost his wife. You will lose Yerushalayim. He could not mourn. You can't mourn because nobody will be Menachem Ava with you. Therefore, you will know that I am Hashem. So Yehazkel's name appears here really is only twice throughout the entire sefer. Um, so what's going on here? Perhaps this really is the, like the climax of the sefer. Right, because what's happening here, this is describing the destruction of the temple. This is describing the death of his wife, the Horban Abayit. And essentially, we're about to shift gears. Right? After this, the temple is essentially destroyed. And now the focus will shift. Because up until this point, most of the Babylonian Jews didn't really believe that this was going to happen. And now that it's happened, essentially, it's a, it's a shift. And so just as we started the Sefer, Yechezkel talked to them, it's like part A is done, part B is now beginning. And that's perhaps why Yechezkel's name, uh, you know, God will give him strength, literally, um, uh, starts, up, starts up again. So uh, with this, we'll, we'll end. Um, and just a reminder, we're not meeting next Monday night at Shavuos. Um, and the following Mondays, we have four more sessions at Yechezkel. Um, we're going to be doing those at 7.15 p.m. because the Minchamar is going to be later. And obviously, we don't want to start our class any later than we already did, already did tonight. So I appreciate everyone coming out later tonight. But uh, in two weeks from now, we'll begin at 7.15 for the last four sessions. I'm happy to stick around for a uh, conversation. No, Shulis lecture. Is, is there a Shavuos learning? There's no Shavuos learning. Oh, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a uh, uh, Lel Shavuot learning. We just sent out an email with the whole line. There's so much stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good night. Two weeks. Good night. <laughs> Very, very complicated, but very good session. Thank you so much. Very complicated. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a Thank you. All righty. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, Rabbi. Good night, Rabbi. Thank you. Have a good week. You too.